Hey, John, how are you? Hi, Glenn. This is Glenn Lowry at The Glenn Show. Uh, we're at Substack, and we're at the YouTube channel, uh, Glenn Lowry Show. And I'm with John McWhorter. He teaches at Columbia University. I teach at Brown. We're the black guys. Uh, we talk every other week here at The Glenn Show about this and that. And I'm happy to welcome back my friend and conversation partner. Happy What's to up, be John? here. Uh, I'm good to be here, Glenn. And um, I think we have some things to talk about today. Um, yes such as certain anniversaries, right? Well, um, it is uh, approximately the 10-year anniversary of the killing uh, by George Zimmerman of Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida, which sparked the Black Lives Matter movement. It was in the commentary after the fact of George Zimmerman's acquittal for that killing uh, that the hashtag Black Lives Matter was introduced and a movement was set afoot. Uh, the New York Times, uh, in Charles Blow's leadership, I think, saw fit to uh, commemorate with a, a special video presentation and editorial comment on the 10-year anniversary, uh, observing that um, the election of Barack Obama didn't occasion a, a movement that um, uh, other events of that sort of the killing of a black man by a police officer or under inappropriate circumstances didn't occasion a movement, but the killing of Trayvon Martin did, and it was therefore a momentous historical event. So yes, we are still within the time frame of uh, acknowledging the momentous consequences of the Trayvon Martin affair. Yeah, I must admit that I had a, um, I had a busy week and I did not, I didn't read that discussion. And I didn't read it because in terms of prioritizing what I took in this week, I must admit that I assumed, and maybe I'm wrong and I need to go back and read it. I assumed that the four of them had things to say that were characterized largely by a kind of pessimism and gloom about race relations. And um, that the idea would be that it sparked Black Lives Matter, but that not nearly as much has changed as we would have hoped. and that. The relationship between the cops and black men still reveals the racist streak that is fundamental to the black experience in America. I assumed that was going to be what they were going to circle around. And but I let figured... me just interrupt. To, just to say the four of them were uh, Charles Blow, uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr., former President Barack Obama, and do you recall? The fourth, it was, was it Nicole Hannah-Jones by any chance? Um, I don't know. Uh, it could be looked up. I must admit, I forget who the fourth was. And I don't mean any disrespect against those people, but I just kind of thought this strikes me as the kind of thing where the tone is going to be of a kind. It was Al Sharpton, excuse me for Oh, Al Sharpton. Okay, that's different. Yeah. I just thought. Al Sharpton, Skip Gates, and Barack Obama with uh, Charles Blow in the background. With all due respect to those people, I thought, I'm not sure their discussion is going to teach us something we haven't heard before. I hate saying that about them. So I didn't get around to it. Do you think I should have? Yeah, I actually, I think it's worth time in the sense that it is about narrative construction. It's about how the event is going into the history books. You've got Henry Louis Gates Jr., a scholar of some eminence. You've got Barack Hussein Obama, the former president of the United States, who was in office at the time of the event. Uh, you've got Al Sharpton, an activist and civil rights leader who is, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what his connection with the family after the killing uh, was. It may be that he was called in. I actually don't know that for a fact, but I expect that that's the case, that he had some involvement in that respect, as did uh, the lawyer Benjamin Crump, who often works in tandem uh, with Sharpton in mm -hmm. helping families of victims in situations of this kind. Um, uh, so, uh, and you have Charles Blow, the columnist, who, as I uh, learned from this 10-year uh, retrospective at the New York Times, which we'll link to uh, in the comment section, I mean, in the uh, descriptive section of this post, um, Blow, you know what the events were. Martin was killed. By Zimmerman. Zimmerman was not arrested. He argued that it was self-defense and the authorities let him go on his own recognizance. 
without arresting him. He was not charged with any crime. After the fact, there was a huge uh, uprising of protest and outrage at the fact that he was not arrested and demands for his arrest uh, and commentary to that effect, of which Charles Blow's column, uh, which came out some weeks after the killing, was a constituent part. He says, this has happened. This man is walking around. Uh, all we know is that the kid was unarmed. He had Skittles and a Coke. Uh, he was minding his own business, and he was pursued by this vigilante and, and shot, and there needs to be a reckoning. And indeed, in the fullness of time, the authorities were persuaded uh, by public uh, pressure to bring charges against Zimmerman, which were brought. He was tried. Uh, he was acquitted by a jury of his peers and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's a question of what actually is going to be the story about Trayvon Martin. And the, we're 10 years out, and that story is pretty much etched in stone, isn't it? And, and, and that story is uh, outrageous killing of a vigilante cop in a stand-your-ground kind of manner where even if he was being assaulted by Martin, he could have retreated. He didn't have to kill him, kind of thing like that. Um, and Black Lives Act actually do matter, even though the authorities often don't act as if they do. And moreover, we need an organized pressure generating movement of, of protest in order to bring about uh, the kind of change that would appropriately value Black lives and et cetera. Um, and of course, Obama was uh, presiding over the country as the president of the United States and uh, made famously the comment, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon in sympathy with the family uh, and so on. Um, so, yeah, I think it's worth, uh, as we're chroniclers of the race conversation in America and the Black Lives Matter movement, which has uh, come in for some critical re reportage of late about their finances, where the money is going and all of that. Um, a, a stock taking of what does this mean for America? What have we learned from all, you know? So for that reason, I'd say, yeah, it's worth taking a look at. Yeah, the whole thing is, um, it's very frustrating because, you know, there's an aspect of, as John Ford said, print the legend. And the legend, I get the feeling, has settled in. I'm not sure how many people even think of it as that Martin attacked Zimmerman and Zimmerman fired. I think uh, the general meme is just that Zimmerman essentially got into a little argument with Trayvon Martin and shot him. I wonder if people quite get that the shot was that Trayvon Martin was much bigger and stronger than Zimmerman and had him pinned on the concrete and was banging his head. Because if people really did understand that that's what went on, I'm not sure so many people would be so convinced that what happened was that Trayvon Martin was murdered in an utterly senseless fashion that, you know, all began simply because he was black and that this says what America is all about. And I, I, my sense is that people are resistant to imagining what actually happened, which was more complicated and much less, um, less, much less condemnatory of Zimmerman, even the, the basic imagery. And you almost hate to say this because you think about somebody who's lost their child, but the iconic picture of Trayvon Martin is of him much younger than when what happened to him happened. And so I think people tend to think of that kind of dewy, dewy skin, big eyed 12 year old in the picture. Whereas really, yeah. he was a tall, strapping young man by the time this happened of the sort who could overpower Zimmerman, as opposed to thinking of Zimmerman as hunting down this, this teen, which is what I think people are imagining. And so what really happened versus what we were told was so different. And I was taken in. I, you know, little known now is that I wrote the kind of pieces Charles Blow would have written. You know, for, certainly bring him in. And my assumption was that the story we were initially told, which was basically that this, this teenaged boy was gunned down after a little scuffle by this bigoted man who had no business pretending to be a cop anyway. I thought that was true. And then gradually it started to not quite make sense. Even then, before, you know, serious analysis had been done. And here we are now where I think what really happened was so very different from what we've been told, right down to the idea that Zimmerman was only on him because he was black. Even that doesn't work if you look at the actual conversations that he had with actual police officers. 
and yet no one will hear it, and they're not going to hear it. And so that begins what we can think of as a whole era in American race relations. It starts in 2012. And yet what actually happened is vastly different from what many people would like to think. And I guess we just have to deal with that, and maybe that's the way history happens sometimes. But goodness, it's frustrating. And you know what else? I'm, I'm very done. But it's also frustrating that Joel Gilbert, whose book and documentary makes it painfully clear what actually happened and how different it was from what we've been told, including that one of the main witnesses was a plant. Unfortunately, he has those associations that are unsavory to many. And because, you know, he has hosted the kind of radio shows he has and kept the kind of company he's kept, unfortunately, a certain kind of person simply shuts down upon hearing that. And so the messenger is unlistenable to what, what we might think of as the left. And so that also keeps the truth from being actually out there. I wish, I wish for the sake of truth and for the sake of real racial healing that it had that been someone else right -winger. who was that interested in the truth. But nobody who wasn't him would have wanted to find those things. You know, no, no quote unquote enlightened, well, I'm not calling him unenlightened, but no person on the left, no normal liberal would want to go to the trouble to find those things. And if they started to find them, they would turn away. Excuse me, John, I just want to uh, make the observation that you're talking about the filmmaker, Joel Gilbert, the documentary filmmaker, whose book and film called The Trayvon Martin Hoax exposes the witness fraud that you're making reference to. You and I have discussed that work of Gilbert's at length here at The Glenn Show, and uh, I'll have uh, links placed in the uh, descriptive, descriptive material of this post that takes people to our prior discussions uh, from 2019 when Gilbert's film came out. Um, and he describes a Trayvon Martin quite different from the figure that has come into the public imagination as a kid with Skittles and, and a Coke who was just, uh, you know, minding his own business. Uh, and he describes uh, a, uh, a George Zimmerman very different from the racist vigilante type. I mean, he was uh, actually a racial liberal. He was, uh, quote unquote, George Zimmerman. He was a Hispanic guy who volunteered his time to tutor some black kids, a uh, big brother them or whatever it might be. And who was, yeah, he was a neighborhood watch guy who was concerned about robberies in the area. And yes, he was suspicious of Trayvon Martin. And after having been told by the radio dispatcher that they didn't need him to get out of his vehicle, he nevertheless got out of his vehicle and the encounter with Martin happened, and Martin is dead. Uh, and that's a tragedy without any question that that young man lost his life out there. Uh, on the other hand, a jury deliberated over all the evidence and, in effect, uh, uh, corroborated the decision at the time that the authorities made not to arrest Zimmerman uh, because they came to the conclusion on the basis of the evidence, including eyewitness testimony, that uh, Zimmerman's account of what happened, he was in danger of his life and he defended himself as he had every right to um, was in fact the correct uh, account of what happened. But again, the narrative about it has entered into the, in, into the pantheon of uh, the accounts of African-American uh, uh, mistreatment uh, such as it has done. And that becomes almost impossible to move, especially if 10 years after Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates Jr., former president of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama, and uh, leading civil rights activist Al Sharpton, with the assistance of a prominent columnist, Charles Blow, all of these are black people, are prepared to endorse the, uh, the uh, storybook narrative that- Which I assume have. they did, right? Uh, the, no one raised, I watched the uh, segment that we're talking about here from the New York Times, a 10-year commemorative uh, a uh, small documentary, I, I mean, it's only 10 or 15 minutes long, and commentary by Charles Blow. And no, uh, there was no second guessing about what actually happened or whether or not the narrative, as we have described it, of, uh, of uh, uh, Martin's victimization, uh, has we have any reason to have any doubts about it, as you and I evidently do have doubts about it. Yeah, and... I think a lot of people jump in at this point and they say, well, why does Trayvon Martin have to have been a choir boy? And he certainly doesn't. Of course, that's what they say. You know, and um, you know, he was not, you know, m many of us aren't. And of course, then it, the idea is, well, he didn't deserve to die. And of course, nobody said that he deserved no. to die. But it's the way that it's thought of 
that matters because the idea that racism killed that guy is really, really flimsy. And yet suddenly when it comes to that case, people are uninterested in the detail because it's, it confirms a certain narrative. And it really is a shame the way this human tendency to, you know, make everything about black and white, so to speak. I remember something that went on with me back then in terms of writing, which I'll say now because it's, it's been so long and it's not that it mattered in the grand scheme of things. But back then I was still, I was still writing for the root and the relationship was fraying because at the root, it was painfully clear that the editor couldn't stand me <laughs> for one thing. And <laughs> I think because it's all among us black people, there's a certain sense of group familiarity. She didn't make much of an effort to demonstrate otherwise, including even live in person. And that was okay, but also it was the only time I've ever had editors. This only happened at the end of my root time. So we're talking about 11. How long were you there? I wrote for the root, I think, for about two years. And under, um, under you know, one or two editors, everything was fine. But then they got a new editor, and I'm not going to say who it was. But there was that. And, you know, I would be, I'd write my pieces. I was writing for them every week for a while. I was grinding out something weekly. And I would write something that rubbed one of the editors the wrong way, and the editors occasionally would write me and you know, say, you know, this isn't one of your stronger pieces. I've never had the copy editor do that. And I understood that, okay, there, there's a sense that it's in-group, all right. But still, yeah. I've been in the business a while. And finally, it got to the point where one editor was outright abusive, you know, just, you know, in the lines, just, you can't blah, 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 blah. Nope, that's just one thing. And once again, I've never experienced this. And I, w I think I was supposed to take it because I'm black and I'm on PC. So I got kind of tired of it and I pulled away. And then me and the editor at this time had a certain reconcilement where <laughs> she kept on saying, the respect is there. The respect is there. But she wouldn't say, we respect you. You could tell she could barely get it out of her mouth. The respect is there. And so this is around when Trayvon happens. And so we're going to build this new relationship. And The Root did some sort of um, Trayvon countdown, like every day, and it's been this long, and you know, some article. And, you know, over the whole year that all of that was raging, and I started writing all over the place about it, during the whole year that was raging, The Root never asked me once to say anything. And the relationship still existed at the time. I got the feeling that they thought that I thought that Martin deserved to die that I was going to say something extremely right-wing and heartless about him. And the simple fact is, nothing I've written ever gives any indication that that's how I would have felt about that, including, at the time, things that you could have seen in New York Magazine and wherever else I was writing. And I could see that these people, who are thoroughly reasonable individuals, thought of me as a bit of a devil. The respect wasn't there. The idea was, don't ask him to write about this, because that's not our policy. What was I going to say? And yet there is this cartoonization that we human beings do. And I'm not completely immune from it, but especially because you and I are on the other end of it so much, I do try harder to resist it than I think many people do. It stunned me. And I thought, look at what this brings out, that these people think I'm going to say that boy should have pulled his pants up and he deserved what he got. You know, suddenly I've been writing, you know, for years, my views are no longer worth even a single airing. That's mean. And that's part of the problem with our race debate, which is that so many people are under the impression that if you don't agree with them, if you don't agree with that certain, you know, that certain left line, then it's either that you're ignorant or you're bad. And once they know you're not ignorant, you're just bad. It's such a shame. <laughs> bad. I got to I got to ask your advice. My little daughter me. just walked by and saw me saying either you're ignorant or you're bad. And she laughed and she's right. It's, it's, it's silly. And now here comes the other one. Either you're ignorant or you're bad. <laughs> Listen to that girlish laughter. What a delight. And you I know, they're ask, right. I was going to ask you right. about it's, it's, something. It's simplistic. Uh, the, the advice I need is, so I'm teaching a course on race, crime, and punishment in America. And of course, we have to deal with this material. Uh, and I've got Trayvon Martin and um, Michael Brown on one end, and I've got George Floyd on the other end of a bookend of events uh, associated with the rise of Black Lives Matter and the 
racial reckoning that culminates in the summer of 2020 and the protests and disturbances and so on. And one of the themes is the narrative is not necessarily consistent with the facts. So, for example, hands up, don't shoot, never happened. This is the Michael Brown fantasy. It simply didn't happen. Uh, Jacob Blake was not unarmed. He had a knife when he was shot. I mean, I'm just giving other, you know, examples of the stuff that kind of, in, in the Trayvon Martin case, the, he wasn't uh, hunted down by a vigilante and, and shot for no reason. It was a self-defense, a jury uh, found to that effect. So here are two questions that come up consistently. One is, so what if the facts are not entirely consistent with the narrative, as Shelby Steele put it in the context of Michael Brown, it's a, it's a poetic truth. It, it's true in effect. It's virtually true. It, it captures a reality played out day in and day out in the interaction between blacks and the cops. And this particular case has happened to become prominent and it can be a vehicle for mobilization against what we know is a real problem. So nitpicking about this or that is, uh, is uh, a very contemptuous, contemptible activity. Disloyal, you, you, yeah. Yeah, they're disloyal and it, it shows the wrong values. I mean, you know, don't you care about the movement, you know, et cetera. That's one thing that comes up. And I wonder what my reaction to that should be. I'm asking for advice. The other thing that comes up is, and, and you hinted at this, the conservatives are having a field day by exactly the kind of narrative that you're talking about now, the counter narrative that you're talking about. They love it when Jonathan Capehart has to apologize for having bought the hand up, don't shoot narrative. And for Jonathan Capehart, the writer for the Washington Post, who uh, famously uh, during this uh, uh, Michael Brown incident uh, confessed that he had been misled and had done and caught hell for harm. Yeah. yeah, and he caught hell for confessing that he was wrong. And indeed, he was wrong. And that harmful story uh, did get out there for a while, and it was believed by a lot of people, and it's still believed Still by there. People. Still there, yeah. Um, so you're helping, you're giving aid and come. You alluded to this with Joel Gilbert. Joel Gilbert is, you know, I, I don't know, he's the Sean Hannity or the Tucker Carlson of uh, documentary filmmaking Alex or something Jones. like that. Alex Jones. He said, yeah, yeah, I mean, he has an Alex Jones. I mean, you know, he, he says Obama's father is not who Obama says his father is, this kind of thing. So if you give any credence to anything that these people say, you're just adding fuel to the fire, you're giving ammunition to the, and it, being a black person doing it is, is just beneath contempt. I mean, how could you do it? This is an invitation for me to not question the narrative. A, because if that fact isn't exactly correct, it's still symbolically representative of a truth that we all know. And B, we have enemies, real enemies, who are heartened uh, and furthered in their ambitions by the kind of counter-narrative rhetoric that you're engaging in. And uh, I, I'm not quite sure how I should uh, handle those objections as they come in from my students. You know, um, sometimes the distance of time creates a certain amount of perspective. And in a way, this starts with OJ. And so yeah, at this point, it's painfully obvious what that man did. It was painfully obvious then. And yet yeah. there was this pact among black Americans of all stripes to pretend not to perceive the facts out of a tacit idea that what we really wanted to do was finally stick it to the cops for the way they treat black people in general. And with OJ, the problem was that it was so obvious that he had killed those two people. It was so obvious that even if the LAPD were you know, far from angels, that this was not a frame up, especially since they had loved him for a very long time. He did it. It's clear. And yet you were supposed to pretend not, even if you were a professor. I watched PhDs in front of classes engaging in that pretense. And I refused at the time and was treated the way you might expect by some people. It was one of the weirdest moments of my life because at the time I didn't completely understand the contours of what we call our race debate. And how that kind of mendacity made its own kind of sense. And I don't know, was that worth it? You know, here we are, it's going to be 30 years later in a few years. 
was it worth it to pretend that OJ wasn't a murderer in order to wake America up to the reality that there's a problem between police forces and black men? And that doesn't even get into that you and I know that the racialization of this whole issue is also something vastly exaggerated that the data does not really support. But that's a whole other layer. And as we've said, it is near impossible to convince most people of that. And so yeah, who are not uh, on you're, the right. you're referring here to the fact that the cops kill a lot of people. Most of them are white. And the idea that this is a uniquely anti-black phenomenon that's going on is, is simply false. And that poverty explains a lot of the remaining disproportion in terms of the fact that black men are still killed disproportionately. Yeah, that's not something that anybody, you know, left of center is completely closed to that argument. But still, was it worth it to get people to pay attention to what the cops can do with OJ. I'm inclined to think not, partly because it was so painfully obvious what he did, and also because the idea wasn't that the cops had hurt him. It wasn't that the cops killed somebody. It was that he killed somebody, and why don't we embarrass the cops by pretending not to think that he did it? Some people, I think, and I know from a really excellent TV special about the whole OJ issue back in 2016, some people would say that that was somehow worth it. But I'm not sure what we really gain from it other than, frankly, a lot of people beginning to think that black people aren't very bright or that black people are manipulative to the extent that some people today think that black woke people are trying to pull one on you because it makes them money or because it gives them power. A lot of that comes from the OJ period where that's what a lot of black people looked like who were insisting that you pretend that that man didn't kill those people. You know, yeah, OJ. Mark Furman was the police officer's name. Mark Furman lied about having used the N-word, apparently. Right. Uh, and um, OJ's lawyer, I'm sorry, I'm blocking on his name right now. Johnny uh, Johnny Cochran. Cochran. Johnny Cochran made a, a big deal out of that uh, with Mark Furman on the stand. And uh, famously... <laughs> If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. <laughs> they because had a it pair rhymed, of gloves it was true. Right. That was supposed to have been the gloves that OJ was wearing at the time that he allegedly committed the crime. And then they brought him into the courtroom and he tried them on and they didn't fit his hand or they fit poorly his hand and so forth and so on. And uh, OJ walked in a circumstance where, as I agree with you, everything that we know about it suggests there wasn't really a whole lot of doubt about whether or not he committed that crime. And uh, a lot of black people. So I, I remember exactly where I was when that jury was announced. I was in Milwaukee. I was speaking at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee on that particular day. And it was around noon when the, uh, when the verdict was announced. And I was on a lunch break and I was in the common room at the student union of the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. <laughs> they had a telescreen up there, you know. Oh, you were uh, there at one of those scenes. I, yeah. I was there where... You could see the difference where the black kids in the audience started cheering. They were jubilant. They were exalted. They were fulfilled. They were happy that OJ had walked, that he had been acquitted. And where a lot of the white kids were tight jawed and sullen and angry and whatnot, because, well, it did appear that he had killed and now he had gotten away. And it was a race card that was played uh, with, uh, you know, with relish. A race card was played. And, you know, Part, some of the argument was from from the black kids was, well, you know, uh, prisons are full of black people, so it's about time one of us got off. And plus, white people are committing crimes every day, and they don't get called to justice. It's about time one of us got off, or whatever. Um, and what I'm trying to get at here is, I think those uh, departures from reality in the service of racial justice narratives which are almost obviously false, but which are nevertheless pressed by people, generates a backlash. And I wonder what cost that backlash actually uh, exacts of us in the long run. A kind of cynicism, a, a kind of thinly veiled contempt from people who are not willing to say exactly what they think. I'm talking about white people. I'm talking about independent, politically, middle of the road, not uh, reactionary uh, uh, right-wing types, but people who might be brought around to support this or that political initiative that uh, you might want to mount, but who in their heart of hearts can't really endorse 
uh, 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 some of the campaign because they they know that it's built on sand and it asks them to be complicit in in lying uh, about uh, things that have happened. And when you think you're winning, you think you're winning when the editors don't allow the story to run on the front page that debunks your narrative. When the talking heads give affirmation to it, even a decade after the fact, when a former president of the United States can act as if there really aren't any questions here, we pretty much know what the story is. You think you're winning, but you might not be winning in the long run. You, you, you might be setting up a situation where you will reap in the reactionary uh, political backlash what you have sown uh, be- because you have the uh, you have command of the of the microphone, uh, but you don't really have command of the hearts and minds of the of the masses of the people, white well, people. You know, and the, this is the thing, though. What you create is skepticism and a certain quiet hostility. Yeah, and if you encounter it, you read it as evidence that racism persists, which unfortunately is what you actually kind of like because that's your comfort zone, because you wouldn't quite know how to orient yourself if you couldn't think of yourself as a victim of systemic racism and subtle personal racism. So it's not exactly unwelcome to a person like that to encounter white skepticism, to encounter white people who don't want to serve on this or that committee with you, or you know the little dissings that might happen because of the skepticism. Because then you can just say, yes, there's the racism that persists. And so all this keeps going in a circle. Because the truth is, yeah, yeah, the, the op-ed page, page editors aren't going to publish something. But, you know, that's not, nobody necessarily knows that. But still, yeah, you feel like you won because everybody in your world, your world of academics and artists and intellectuals and activists and jurists, et cetera, everybody in your world toes the line. And I'm not sure to which extent these people know that it's a towing of a line, because I think they sequester these things off into a region of their brains that I don't quite understand. And that's not me saying they're crazy. But yeah, next thing you know, the white skepticism from everybody apart from your world, it just confirms the racism that made you do all this pretending in the first place. But yeah, it's um, it's funny. I guess it's not coming. I'm always assuming that the beautiful example of this is going to be the movie about, about Michael Brown. I figure if somebody was going to do it, they would have done it by now. Maybe the pandemic has held it up. But there's going to be a movie made by these earnest 30-something black people. And they're going to, in interviews, say that they wanted to give acknowledgement to, quote-unquote, all views of what happened. And so it's going to not, they are not going to not show um, Don't Shoot with His Hands Up. There's no way they're going to leave that out and actually reenact what actually happened. They're going to show him with his hands up saying, don't shoot on some level. And I'm guessing that it's going to be done with some sort of strobe lighting, quick cutting, making that whole part very abstract so that you don't have to be responsible for showing any one truth. You're going to be able to interpret it in many ways. The camera is going to spin. They're going to do the Spike Lee thing up ahead. The whole thing is going to be designed to allow that what Mike Brown's friend lied and said actually happened. And the filmmakers are going to call it artistic license. They're going to talk about how this isn't a documentary. They're making a piece of art. But, oh, I'm sorry. But they're going to make it so that it gives truth to that. I'm waiting for the film that will enshrine the original narrative out of a sense that that is what black people are supposed to show and that's what black people are supposed to be shown and, and to see. And no, I don't, a lot of people will see that. Well, the thing is though, Glenn, the reviewers will respect that. When you, when you read that reviewed in the usual organs, it'll be how dazzling the film is for this reason or that. That's a problem because yeah, yes. a great many people will know that it's lies. Ironically, there really is a film about the Michael Brown affair that's quite good. It's a documentary film made by Eli Steele and Shelby Steele uh, called What Killed Michael Brown. Uh, and I, I think it's very well made and it's, it's very thoughtful and provocative. Uh, it takes a slant all, that's entirely consistent with the posture that you and I have adopted here of skepticism about the myth-making uh, from incidents of this sort. Uh, it is conservative in some of its uh, suppositions about social policy and so on. 
This is the film, What Killed Michael Brown. It's worthy of attention. Uh, it got some attention in the right-wing press, but I don't think it got any very much attention at all in the mainstream uh, organs and uh, probably has not been viewed nearly as much as it should. I urge everybody who's interested in this conversation to, to see that film. There has been a uh, mainstream media uh, television documentary series uh, at Paramount uh, about the Trayvon Martin killing, uh, Rest in Power, uh, the Trayvon Martin story or something like that. I mean, it's like six episodes or something like that, which I confess I have not, I have not viewed, but I, I did review the, the thing in uh, preparing for this conversation, and it, it's, it's out there. Uh, and you know, people can, can check it out. What's in it? Um, they have segments on his background. They interview his mother and his father. They talk about the incident. They talk about the aftermath, the, the trial and so on. Um, I, as I say, I haven't actually, it's like six episodes. I just, I just went, you know, looking in the database for what's out there. And I found that this 2018, uh, is the date on this Paramount, uh, studio uh, uh, miniseries. You know, one of the most striking things about what killed Michael Brown, if you actually watch it, and I heard evidence that it was, um, there were people discouraged from acknowledging it or reviewing it on the left. And I now, what an old manish thing to have to say. I can't remember what that was, but there was something, there was a story about its suppression of yeah. some kind that, um, I invite the audience to look up cause it wasn't that long ago, but the most striking thing about that documentary was that it showed that there have been some black activists or protesters in Ferguson and the surrounding areas who've never given up the old idea, the, the old story, and are fighting that same battle and are indignant that anybody would disbelieve it. You know, they're insisting that, you know, Michael Brown died in that way or in some way related to it and that to quibble is unnecessary. And to actually see the film, you know, high def color film of these protesters insisting on striking that same tone about what happened to that boy is um, indicative of the sort of suspension of disbelief that we're talking about in that these men are clearly not crazy. And yet they will not let go of the way they felt about what happened to him now eight years ago. And you know, what you get also is the idea that, well, the injustice is that they let him lay in the street for four hours. And that is, hardly ideal, but you notice that frankly, that alone is not the sort of thing that you think of as evidence that nothing has changed on race in America, et cetera. There's a convenience to it. For some people, they read the reports, they can see that what happened was not simply that that boy was gunned down for no real reason, but there has to be some sort of major indignation. You have to have something about Ferguson where you can keep that same tenor of fury. And so then it becomes, well, they let him lay out. And, you know, you know, it's, people are clearly gaining something from nurturing that particular feeling. And gosh, I wish that more black people didn't need that to feel whole. That's the thing. And I think many Caribbean and African black immigrants look on this sort of thing and just see clearly that there's something different about the way black Americans are encouraged to think on matters like that. And I remember one woman, when, it was when I was at Berkeley, and there was an administrative assistant who was of African descent. And I forget what the circumstances were, but she and I were asking about a black American scholar who was going to come speak, a young black American scholar. And I'll never forget the way she put it. She said, does he like himself? And I said, what? And she said, does he like himself? Or is he going to be exaggerating and, you know, talking about racism as if it's an obstacle to his success, et cetera? I hope he likes himself. And I thought, what a, to me, that sounds so diagonal because we see that black guy making that kind of noise as exhibiting some kind of pride. But she just, she got it right there. And I had a conversation. What was very her background? Recently. I'm sorry. What was her what? background? What was what? her ethnicity? She, I don't remember because we're talking about almost 30 years ago, but she's probably yeah. from Nigeria. It was either ah, Senegal or Nigeria. Right. And just the other day, I was talking to that same kind of person, another, this was a scholar from Niger, actually, and quite unbidden, she had the exact same opinion that it's about, and I didn't ask her, but 
she saw it. You know, she doesn't talk about it too loudly, especially these days, but she saw it as a matter of pride. She said that people who engage in that kind of dialogue don't seem to actually like themselves. And I frankly agree. And, you know, those are the same people who think that we're self-hating. No. If you need to feel indignant to the point that you massage events and exaggerate, you don't like yourself because you don't know what it's like to actually like yourself because you've only known liking yourself on the basis of that instead of on the basis of being an individual with your own predilections and your own tendencies and your own talents and your own eunice. They don't, they don't get that. I feel so sorry for them, frankly. The only thing you can really, you only, the thing you think of yourself as most worthy and interesting for is exaggerating about something in a theatrical way and resisting evidence that you might not be right about these things. That's a sad way to be. It really is. Okay, here's something that I think many conservative observers will note, which is you're confused about why this kind of thing happens over and over and over again. Because A, there's a lot of money on the table. People are getting paid. Careers are being made out of this. Benjamin Crump is, would be a case in point. These settlements that the lawyers are able to get with municipalities when you have a viral incident that is a very bad press for the politicians involved and whatever people settle and people get paid reputations get made i mean no one is uh and, and the other point is no one is ever held accountable for the line johnny cochran may he rest in peace uh becomes a very famous lawyer for getting oj off from you know uh what i think most people looking at the facts would have to conclude he actually did which is murder nicole brown simpson um Al Sharpton has never been uh, asked to pay any price for the Tawana Brawley hoax, which ruined the lives of uh, law enforcement personnel who were uh, vilified and uh, persecuted uh, by Sharpton's demagoguery. Um, Jesse Smollett gets, what, six months for uh, that uh, hoax? Uh, finally, finally, finally. Uh, we, we'll see how much time he actually serves. There are a lot of people who are saying he shouldn't serve any at all. And the DA who tried to get him off, Kim Fox, who had to be overruled, she's not going to pay any price at the ballot box for um, her, perhaps, many would say, abuse of the powers of her office on behalf of protecting a black celebrity from the consequences of his inappropriate behavior. Uh, you know, there's no accounting at the end of the day for uh, if Jonathan Capehart had decided not to apologize, no one would have said anything about it. So uh, it's remunerative. That's why people do it. That's why it has such a stubborn, repeated cycle of myth-making, because it's remunerative. Um, and there are no consequences even when you get called out. Yeah, it's, Johnny Cochran was interesting because you have to admit, he was damn good at what he did. <laughs> yeah, you do have to admit that. And I remember thinking, um, I wish that someone like him would be famous with, with those, with that skill. If it wasn't about proving that racism exists, I would love to have seen, and I know that he did plenty of things in his career, but he doesn't, he didn't become famous for that. Wouldn't the black have been Clarence Darrow. Yes, exactly. Where is the black Clarence Darrow? And I'm not, I'm not saying that black people don't have the talent. You don't get the attention for that. I would love there to be a black Clarence Darrow. It's interesting with him. I was at an event. This is 20 one years ago now this is when i first started actually meeting people like this and i remember at the time it was in a it was an M msnbc event in birmingham this was weird on so many levels al sharpton was there and i very carefully avoided being near him because i didn't want to shake his hand then i i felt about him then frankly the way you seem to and i thought i'm not breaking well, any I'll, I'll shake his hand, but I might break his wrist while I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, people. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I was going to say that Cochran was there, and I reached out and shook his hand oh. because I just thought, as much as I am disgusted by this whole OJ business, I admired his mind, like his skill. And I thought, yeah, I'll shake his hand for that. I, I enjoyed watching the performance. But I just wish it hadn't been about that, you know? Ugh. Yeah, really something. At that Let's same about, event, yeah, Dinesh, you tell us Dinesh stories, you tell us stories everybody. Dinesh oh. D'Souza, and everybody hated him. And I was kind of wondering, why in the world would you come 
to this, but for some reason he was there. And then it's interesting, some other people who were there who I think thought they were big celebrities at the time, and so did I. And it's interesting, you see how careers just kind of disappear. And you notice that that event today would have completely different people. But yeah, I remember shaking Johnny Cochran's hand and thinking, what did I just do? But it was because I enjoyed the mental acuity. I just thought, whatever this was in you Southern did. California? It, did, hmm? Were you in Southern California? This was in Birmingham, Alabama. It was commemor <coughs> Dinesh commemorating. Dinesh was there? For some reason, they invited him. And I was thinking, yeah. what? And everybody hated him backstage. You know, people yeah. are giving him trouble. But he was there. It was weird. And I the was just a baby season. then, you know. Yeah, you were just, your, your book was out, though. Yes, it was in the wake of losing the race. Losing yeah. the race. Well, I'm thinking that Susan's the end of racism if they're talking race, and he's a conservative voice, although he went and he wasn't further, considered and further into the fever swamps. So. Right, yeah, he wasn't crazy at that point, but still, yeah. No, I was going to invite you, we got a few minutes here, uh, changing the subject, to talk about a great American musician who's underappreciated, Scott Joplin. I saw that you had a piece, <laughs> and I wanted to share with the audience the joy of uh, your remembrance of the contributions mm -hmm. and the significance of Scott Joplin. Well, he left us 105 years ago, um, I think this week. And um, he was more interesting than people think because he was trying to create a kind of American classical music that didn't just sound like European classical music. Didn't sound Joplin grew up poor. He was the... Um, he was the son of people who had been former slaves. Um, he grew up in and around a small town called Texarkana. Oh, yeah. And he got some informal piano lessons um, when he was a kid because there was a piano in the house where his mother did, did work as um, a maid. And then he had other piano lessons as he got older. He was never an incredible pianist and didn't claim to be. He could play his own music and other music, and he made part of his living playing what became ragtime piano. But he was also, if you had known him, he died at 48. He had spent a lot of his life on the road, mostly in the Midwest, singing in quartets and octets, barbershop sorts of things, and also playing the cornet. And so he was an all-around music musician who made his living. He married or more or less married three times. Um, and he was present at the invention of this music called ragtime. And he wrote what was the first truly excellent rag, maple leaf rag, which was you know, nobody had heard anything that good in, until 1899 when he published it. There had been some rags before, but frankly, who wants to hear them now? He's What's the one distinctive, who showed. What's excuse me, about ragtime? What, what marks it as a, as a genre? Ragtime is a, a European march on the bottom umpa 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 uh -huh. with the top dancing around the rhythm in syncopation hitting on the off beats as well as the quote unquote on beats so that you have this catchiness that believe it or not people weren't used to until then so if you're tapping your foot to the entertainer or the maple leaf rag you're tapping yeah. it and you're moving your head in a way that most people found almost narcotic at the time, if somebody put words to the rags, which they did sometimes, often they would say, you can barely keep your feet from moving, yeah. as if that's new. But this was a very new kind of music. It was this Euro-African hybrid. And then you also get some blues harmonies as rag goes on. And Joplin only wrote them for you know the, the lesser part of 20 years. But they get more and more complicated. And after a while, some of them are barely rags at all. And it's a kind of a, an African Chopin that he creates. And the pieces are hard to play. I, I learned how to play the piano beyond basics by just learning how to play Joplin's rags, especially the later ones to the note, working at it, because it's hard. And if you can get that, then it allows you to play almost anything on that level and below. It's a good way to learn how to play the basic piano. And he was very good at it. He had a great sense of melody. He had a beautiful sense of harmony, but he also wanted to take it further he wanted to write, for example, an opera based on this Euro-African hybrid. Not necessarily a ragtime opera, but he wanted to write an opera that was about black people and had a black flavoring. And he wrote one called Tremonitia. 
And you know, the truth about Tree Minister, where the theme of this show is telling the truth, the truth is that he didn't have the musical training. And because of segregation, he didn't have the opportunity to attend enough opera, and that's not his fault, for Tree Minister to be great. Tree Minister is a highly uneven work. There are a lot of there are a lot of parts of Tree Minister that are frankly a little dull. There's some great parts, do, but do it's know, not it's not a masterpiece. Do you but, know uh, Ishmael Reed's book? Um, uh, gosh, what does he call it? Uh, which one? This is the one <laughs> in which Trima Nisha Smarts is the female protagonist. Reckless eyeballing. No, I don't know that one. Okay, this is mm. a novel. Ishmael Reed, the African American novelist of distinction, and Reckless Eyeballing is. Long story short, it's it's about a black guy who's trying to make it into the theater with a lot of feminist and uh, a, a race card playing a female playwright named Trimanisha Smarts, who's an Alice Walker lookalike. Mm. Uh, ah. And <laughs> but he calls her Trimanisha, and I'm I'm pretty sure he took that from this uh, work that you're referring to. He's got that from the revival of Joplin's opera in the '70s. Yeah, and it was yeah. done on PBS, and you can watch it. And what nobody ever wanted to admit was that it's not Porgy and Bess. It's not that good. It's interesting. But Joplin just died too soon. He got syphilis. A great many people who did what he did occupationally back then got syphilis and died young. And so he dies at 48 without Tremonisha having gotten around that much. And frankly, it wasn't going to, but he was writing more things. And the other things he was writing, he was doing a symphony. He was doing a musical. He would have hit some sort of pay dirt, but he died before he could... He could do it. And Tree Manisha is, in spots, interesting. So that's who Scott Joplin is. He was taken away too early. He came to live in New York, and you know, his life just went downhill and downhill. And he, um, there's a movie with Billy D. Williams, and Scott Joplin didn't look like Billy D. Williams. He didn't act like Billy D. Williams, but there was a TV movie in the 70s that very nicely tells you everything you'd like to know about Scott Joplin and makes him look like he was sexy and, you know, kind of foxy, which, you know, it's, it's a good movie, even though it has nothing to do with what he apparently was like in real life. Speaking of movies, when I think uh, ragtime, I think of The Sting, you know, that uh, Paul Newman and Robert Redford vehicle, which has a soundtrack that is all uh, ragtime. That's I what made America ragtime crazy. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's who Scott Joplin is, and I wrote about him for the Times. I was surprised that the article really got around, but his music is worth listening to, the rags in particular, and they've been you know, widely recorded at this point. And um, yeah, he's, um, he's worth more than just thinking about the Maple Leaf rag and the entertainer. And if you're a certain age, you remember the sting, and you probably tried to play the entertainer on the piano. There's more to Joplin than that. And I, you know, I caught the sting. And I play the entertainer on the piano. And then I was taught that there's so much more that he wrote. And frankly, all of it, almost all of it is better than the entertainer. So, yeah, I recommend a, a, a listen to more Scott Joplin. All right, John. Um, I think that's a wrap. I think so. <laughs> We're going to get into trouble again. You know that, don't you? Yeah, about all sorts of things, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, good talking to you. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. You too. See you soon.